Spears have got here just in the nick of time. What does that make us? Big damn heroes, sir. Ain't we just? Well, once again, here we go with those wacky creationists. Just when you thought they were all busy making misspelled signs for tea party rallies, here they come again with a whole bunch of messed up understanding of basic relativity. So I thought I'd walk it through step by step to show them that their Bronze Age books has got this one exactly backwards. Here's an example of relativity in action. In this picture, there's any number of valid frames of reference. It's equally valid to say that the skateboarder is going to hit the post or that the post is about to hit the skateboarder, for example. In relativity, there's only one time you can define an absolute frame of motion, and that is when the observer is accelerating. It ceases to be a mathematical game at that point. So when this kid's momentum intersects that of the pole, the resulting acceleration will turn his meat and two veg into bangers and mash. Well, at least he'll do well in his abstinence-only class. At its most basic level, any rotating body is undergoing a continuous state of acceleration. This is what high school st physics students learn about when they discuss centrifugal force. Because of the existence of a centrifugal force, it is indeed possible to determine if a body is rotating. This is called absolute rotation, and Isaac Newton figured out how to measure this as early in an early feat of relativity. Here's a little thought experiment. For this experiment, we will only be concerned with motion in the plane of rotation. Imagine a carousel mounted in the middle of an ice rink. You spin up the carousel and stand on the edge where the green dot is. What happens when you step off the carousel at this point? The answer is you will travel in a straight line towards the target. This is because your momentum at any given instant is in a tangent to the circle of your rotation. Anyone who has ever spun a ball on a string before letting it go can attest that this is the case. Now let's imagine we take our carousel into space in a location free from any significant gravity and place it in a position motionless relative to a distant star. At the edge of the circle we place a gun that fires in an exact tangent to the circle. The gun is of course cleverly compensated for recoil so that isn't an issue. When we fire the red ball directly at the star, what do we see through the gun sight? Well, we see the red ball fly towards the center of the star, and since there are no other forces at work here, the picture will look pretty much the same indefinitely, other than the ball becoming smaller, of course. Now we repeat the experiment, only this time we will spin the platform counterclockwise once every 100 hours. At the precise instant the star is aligned with our gun, we fire. What will we see now? The ball remains aligned with the star, but they both drift to the right of the image. Again, once every hundred hours, this image would be repeated. Now in our final setup, the platform will remain motionless, but this time the star will orbit around the carousel once every 100 hours in a clockwise direction as seen from above. Again we fire our tangent gun, and what do we see? Initially, we see the same picture as before, but as we watch, the star will appear to drift to the right of the ball. Once every 100 hours, however, the picture will be momentarily the same as the alignment repeats itself. This is because there are no forces to deflect the ball, and again, it will travel in a straight line indefinitely away from us. I've just given you a observational difference between a geostationary and a geocentric universe and the real one that the rest of us live in. So right about now, a lot of creationists are feeling like this kid. Now the creationists already have an objection to this. They claim that the ball itself would be carried around the circle because it would be quote-unquote moving with space itself. Leaving aside the fact that they don't have a plausible net mechanism for this to happen, I mean after all, how can empty space carry anything along with it? There is a fundamental flaw in this reasoning. The ball itself has momentum that must be conserved. Imagine that we take our carousel and put it on top of a circular conveyor belt that's turning clockwise. And this time our ball gun will roll the ball an exact tangent to our circle. According to Newtonian physics, the ball should continue to roll straight down this dashed yellow line. Therefore, in order to carry the ball around the circle as they propose, space itself would have to begin to exert a force upon the ball as it traveled. 
And so eventually our ball would actually experience a complete reversal of its momentum and actually experience an outward flinging motion, if you will, from the centrifugal force that's being induced. And so what we would see is an optical illusion from our rotating platform and their model would actually have to be replaced by a change in momentum and that has physical consequences that they are not prepared to explain. But I'm just getting started. The spacecraft stays aloft because the outward force of its momentum balances the inward force of the Earth's gravity. Without sufficient momentum relative to the Earth's center of mass, gravity will win and the spacecraft will crash. And just to make it absolutely clear, this requirement for the rocket's momentum is regardless of whether the Earth turns or not. For example, a satellite can orbit the moon, which has only a slight rotation. It's a certain amount of momentum required relative to the Earth's center of mass. In order to achieve orbit as efficiently as possible, a spacecraft is launched in an easterly direction. This way it gains approximately a 1,000 mile per hour head start from the Earth's rotation relative to the Earth's center of mass. However, in Bowden's model, it's space that's rotating to the west. Therefore, the calculations made by the rocket scientists would be off by 1,000 miles per hour. This would mean that the spacecraft would not achieve sufficient momentum to overcome the Earth's gravity and therefore would fail. And so every time a spacecraft launches, the energy it uses is exactly the energy we would expect it to use if the Earth was rotating. Even if we were to accept that space can rotate a body without inducing a centrifugal force, the geocentrists have no plausible mechanism to get a rocket into that frame of motion that doesn't defy observational data. For example, the Stardust spacecraft that we just saw launched reached an altitude of 14 miles in a little over one minute. In that same amount of time, space has drifted 16 miles to the west yet we see no effect on the rocket. And so once again we have a situation where the geocentrists require a physical law to be selectively applied. It also emits aircraft, birds, balloons, and witches, as well as our weather. Will somebody please get these guys some ice? Let's take a look at the launch of the Stardust spacecraft. It took a little over 5 minutes and 50 seconds to achieve its initial orbit, but I've cut that down to a minute 10. Notice that the spacecraft accelerates smoothly away from the Florida coast over the Atlantic Ocean. There's no sign of it drifting to the west as required by the geostationary model. Isn't that pretty? So there you have it. In order to match the observational data, geocentrism requires a mechanism that can change the momentum of the spacecraft in violation of the laws of physics for rotating bodies. Even if this existed, such a mechanism would be detectable whenever anything flies, especially a spacecraft. To do otherwise would be in violation of the laws of the conservation of momentum and energy. And as this video shows, that mechanism simply does not exist. Epic fail for the creationists once again. If I'm your mission, Shepard, best give it up. You're welcome on my boat. God ain't.